Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all that he does. And so we gather this evening to sing joyfully to the Lord because indeed his word is true and he is faithful. Those promises are for you and for your children, for those who are far off as we come to worship this evening. Let's go to God in a time of silent prayer, asking that he would bless our worship and that he would prepare our hearts to encounter him. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would prepare our hearts for worship, that we would be stilled in your presence, that we would come in reverence and adoration, that we would sit and stand in awe as we encounter you here in this place. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's stand and sing our opening hymn of praise, There is a Redeemer, verses 1 through 3. This evening, the Lord greets you with these words. He says to you, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the sevenfold spirit before his throne, from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings on earth. And all God's people said, amen. This evening, we have opportunity to confess what we believe together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Everyone, everyone saying together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's sing together, Seek ye first the kingdom.
may be seated. At this point, ask the children to come forward to be dismissed for children in worship. Hi. We can hold hands. Yay. All right. It's good to see so many of you. We gotta bet. We gotta make the circle bigger. We gotta get some more okay, people in. Okay. Just, there you go. I don't know about huge. All right. It is huge. That's a good thing, right? We're thankful for so many of you to be here tonight. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these, your covenant children. We thank you that they are here worshiping with us tonight. We pray a special blessing on them as they encounter your word, as they hear stories about you. We pray that your word would work faith in their hearts. We pray ultimately for each of these little ones that the the promises made to them in their baptism would be true, that they would be your children, your covenant children, and that they would have new hearts, hearts that love you, hearts that are conformed to your image, and hearts that seek to obey you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can go. What? All right. Before we go to God in congregational prayer, we'll be asking for prayer requests. Um, and before that, two announcements. Um, Dan DeGroote is recovering at home. He had an infection. That was the cause of his illness. Um, so he's already been to the doctor, had that diagnosed, taken care of, and we'll be praying that he continues to recover. Also, yes, it does smell like natural gas. Um, one of the burners was left on, was probably turned on by a child today. So um, that's the reason for the smell. It's already been addressed, just in case any of you are worried about your safety. Any prayer requests this evening? In Sunday school with the 11th and 12th graders, I always ask one of them to close in prayer every day, and I can wait a long time before one of them volunteers. Yeah. We have a couple of moms that are very, very close to baby Jake. Dr. Aaron and Mr. Jason Aaron. Yes, we'll pray for the expecting mothers as they eagerly await the day to come, I understand. Yes, okay. And that's your daughter and son-in-law, right? Okay. Yeah, in Canada. Yep. Gerald and Jane, uh, daughter and son-in-law, experiencing, yeah, significant lockdowns and things of that nature. We pray for them. We're thankful for the freedom that we do enjoy. Um, but also especially for, there's a lot of Christian Reformed churches in Canada that are seeking to minister in, in that context, in the severity of the restrictions there. So we'll pray for them. Anybody else have anything? Jerry? Um, I know that our daughter and mother had a colonoscopy on Thursday, which was really just a second of a breast issue. And she went to have an MRI on Thursday, second of a day. Um, just to say that very good job for the Jewish family. Yep. Pray for Maya Brands as she seeks to uh, yeah, have some clarity from the doctor about some of the digestive issues that she's having scary I'm sure definitely remember to keep her in our prayers Jackal what's his first name again pray for Harlan um, some of you might know Harlan he's a member of Shalom CRC in Sioux Falls. Uh, he's in the hospital on a ventilator with COVID. It's Harlan Santima.
Linda. Nels Highlander. Pray for Linda's uncle Nels as he, uh, yeah, fails, his health fails. Anyone else? Yep. I have an eye on my chest tomorrow to see how the treatment, treatment status works for his cancer. Praying for Harlan as he gets has testing tomorrow. Uh, pray that he has good results as they seek to continue to treat his cancer. All right. With that, let's go to God in a time of congregational prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening expectantly coming into your presence knowing that you have promised wherever two or three are gathered in your name there you will be as well and so we expect this evening that your holy spirit would be here moving among us active doing his work in our hearts tearing down the idols that we've constructed but also building us up in faith, hope, and love, conforming us each day more and more to the image of Jesus Christ. Father, as we gather this evening, we come from many different homes, many different occupations, many different ages and stages in life, but we come to you with this in common, that we claim you as our God, we claim Jesus Christ as our Savior and our Lord, and we cling to the promises that you make to us. Father, we know that in Romans you promise to work all things for the good of those who love you, who have been called according to your purpose. But Father, we confess that oftentimes we do not understand your purposes in the world, in our lives, in the lives of those who we love and care about. And so, Father, this evening we Lift before you these requests for healing, for guidance and discernment. We pray that you would be with Pastor DeGroat as he continues to recover from the infection that he has. We thank you for skilled doctors to diagnose and treat that. And we pray for a full recovery for him. And that we would anticipate eagerly the next time he's able to join us in worship and lead us. Anticipate how you will bless us through him and his continued ministry. Father, we too pray for the expecting mothers in our congregation who are very near their due dates. We pray that you would give them peace, that you would still their fears and anxieties as, as they eagerly await the day for their children to, to be born, to come forward into the world Father, what an incredible day that is when we get to meet the little ones that you give us, the covenant children that you bless us with. We thank you for the many prayers already that have been prayed for each of these children. Father, we know that as a congregation, we have an idea of them coming. As their mothers, they know them well. But Father, you know them intimately. You know their names. You know the deeds that they will do. You know the lives that they will lead. You know the impact that they will have and the place that you're preparing for them in your kingdom work. So, Father, we turn that expectation, that anticipation, and even that anxiety over to you. Resting in, in who you are and the control that you exert over our lives. Father, too, we pray for our brothers and sisters across the border in Canada who seek to to do ministry there, who seek to live lives there and deal with the restrictions that are placed upon them. We particularly pray for Craig and Julie as they seek to, to live and to minister there. We pray for churches in Canada, especially Christian Reformed churches who we have such an affinity with and a partnership with, that you would bless them in this time of upheaval, that you would give them faithful ministers, faithful elders, 
that they would be given wisdom to operate um, and to care for the spiritual needs of their congregation within which the context that you have put them. We pray especially that your word would still be preached and that your people would still be edified by it. Father, we pray for, for Maya, and especially in the week to come as she consults with doctors, that they would find answers for the troubles that ail her, that they would be skilled, and that they would have wisdom in treating that ailment so that she would not deal with, with those issues, those problems, the effects and symptoms anymore. We pray, Father, that, that healing would be quick, we pray that she would not have, have to worry in the days and weeks ahead. Father, too, this evening we pray for Harlan as he's on a ventilator. We pray that you would give him healing, ultimately, Father. That's what we pray. Just this morning, Father, in, in junior and senior catechism, you helped us to ponder the promises that you have for us in this life, but also in the life to come. That we can take solace and in who you are and in your promises, that even though death is the final enemy that we face, that we do not do so as people who are afraid or as people that have no hope. And so, Father, we pray for healing for Harlan. We pray for his family, for peace. But ultimately, Father, we know that it is a joyous occasion when you call your children home to be with you. Even though we don't always under, understand the timing or appreciate it, even though we struggle to see your work in it, even though we question you similarly to Job, who did not know why his children would be taken away in the time or fashion that they were, but yet we confess that our Redeemer lives and that in the end, we will see him with our own eyes and not another. Father, we pray for Linda's uncle Nels as he continues to decline in health. We pray that you would give their family peace, that you would give Nels peace, that he would cling to you, that he would be comforted by you. Father, we pray for Harlan as he awaits tests in the week to come. We pray that his cancer would be receding that would be go that he it would go back into remission that he would not have to deal with it that it would not plague or trouble him in the days ahead we pray that as a church body you would help us to minister to him and to encourage him father as we pray for all these people in our congregation or connected to our congregation it's it's very clear to us that we live in a fallen world and that sin impacts us in in a myriad of ways even our physical bodies are impacted by sin. So we eagerly await your return. We eagerly await Christ's second coming. When we will be given resurrection bodies. Bodies that are free from sin, free from ailment, free from death and decay. Father, we thank you for the hope that we have in you. Father, too, we pray for all those who have burdens that we do not know publicly, even though they are heavy on their hearts. We pray that you would help them to share with your people, that you would help us to lift their burdens with them. We pray that you would help us to walk this life together as your people, people who share with one another, who share joys and concerns, who share sorrows and victories, Father, in this week ahead, we pray that you would bless us in, in our many tasks and activities. We pray that you would give us fruitful weeks of labor, of vocation, whether we stay at home and care for children, whether we craft sermons and seek to minister to others spiritually, whether we take care of animals and feed livestock, whether we take care of people as nurses or doctors, whether we help people financially provide as accountants, as financial analysts, or whether we go about life as retirees, seeking to do the work that you've called us to do after we have 
laid aside our full-time vocation. Father, we look into the week ahead and we see that there is uncertainty there. And that's why we gather together this evening to know you certainly, to know your promises, to be reassured in them and of them, to be encouraged for the week ahead, to be given hope, to receive your blessing, to meet you in this place where you have promised to be, to meet us. And so, Father, we pray these things to you, pleading the the name of Jesus, being people washed in his shed blood, praying in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our scripture for this evening will be from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 through chapter 4, verses 20, verse 8. So that's 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10. That can be found on page 1,855 in your pew Bible. And as you turn to that page, you may stand for the reading of God's word. The sermon this evening comes from 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 10 through chapter 4, verse 8. And the title of the sermon is Preach the Word. Paul's charge to Timothy. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings. What kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil men and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know these from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God might be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great many number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all your duties. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. I have fought the good faith, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. You may be seated. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord will stand forever. Sometimes, whether in listening to a sermon in church or in reading the Bible on our own, we come to texts, we come to passages that we really struggle to relate to. They seem to be written in a different time to a different people, and we can feel the thousands of miles that separate us not only from the geographical place of their origin, but also from the miles that seem to separate the text from our lives. Here in America, here in Inwood in the 21st century, But this evening, I hope that none of you feel this way. As we read our text from 2 Timothy, I hope that you do not feel that way because here we find Paul writing to his disciple and his friend, Timothy. And there are two threads in particular in our text this evening that seem as if they found their way into our Bibles straight from our lives, from recent tabloids, from our lived experience. The first of these common threads is found in chapter 4, verse 3 and 4, where Paul wrote, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, 
But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. All you have to do is peruse the titles at a Christian bookstore to see that this is the case. Here we find titles written by so-called pastors of, of vast congregations. They write books called Love Wins or The Power of Positive Thinking or Your Best Life Now. And one can only help imagining what Paul would ask an author like Joel Osteen after so clearly writing to Timothy that all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. One can hardly imagine how we could twist these words of Paul into a health and wealth prosperity gospel. But ignoring them altogether may do the trick because pastors, in quotation marks, Pastors such as these have amassed followers and have amassed wealth by catering to itching ears. And it's precisely because of these itching ears that Paul urges Timothy to continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And that leads to the second common thread so many of us share here this evening, that so many of us share with Timothy. We share a heritage of faithfulness passed on from one generation to the next. Just like Timothy, not all of us by any means, but many of us have been blessed with godly parents and grandparents. Sadly, this point is often lost on some of us especially young people like myself or those of you who may be even younger still. Growing up with devotions around the dinner table, a church where the Bible is preached, Sunday school and catechism classes where the Bible is studied, Bible class in an intentionally Christian school that seeks to bring all areas of study to light by God's Word. All of these things, but so often we miss the implicit testimony. We miss the overarching theme that is being driven home, that God's word is our life, God's word is our breath, God's word is the food that nourishes us. It is of paramount importance, and all of life is to be built around it, undergirded by it, and integrated with it. And so it is that we, with Timothy, thank God for his gracious providence in putting us in a place with such an emphasis, such a priority on the word. We thank Him for parents and grandparents who want to make it impossible for us to grow up without encountering this living Word over and over and over and over and over again. So let's continue as we study these sacred writings and pray that by them God would make us wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. We read in verse 16 that all Scripture is breathed out by God. God is the author of the very words we find written before us this evening. But one of the interesting things about the history of the Bible is that the chapters and verses were not a part of the original manuscripts. So the chapter divisions, the verse divisions, they're not a part of the original manuscripts that we find translated for us in our Bibles. They were added later. They're extremely helpful, especially as we explore the richness and depth of God's Word. But our text today contains an instance of what might be one of the most unfortunate chapter divisions in the entirety of Scripture. Here we so often pause, not only verbally, but mentally as well. And because of that, it's easy to miss out on Paul's trajectory in 2 Timothy. We're very familiar with this last half of chapter 3. As a Bible-believing congregation, we believe and often hear that all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And that's where our memory verse ended. Or the sermon series took pause until the next week. We take a break just before Paul's argument His logical crescendo reaches its climax. So let's try that again. 
All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, I charge you, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Paul's focal point in this letter to Timothy is preach the word. And what makes this even more remarkable are the circumstances in which Paul writes this letter, which Paul pens these words. 2 Timothy is the last letter that Paul will write chronologically in the New Testament. Right? It doesn't show up at the end of our New Testament, but it's, it's the last letter that Paul will write chronologically. According to Paul's statements in chapter 1, verse 8, and chapter 2, verse 9, we know that Paul is in prison. In fact, this is his second Roman imprisonment, the second time that he's been put in jail by the Romans. And unlike his writings during his previous imprisonment, Paul does not expect to be released. He does not expect to be released, but rather he expects to die. In chapter 4, verse 6, he is very clear. He says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. Paul is a man whose days are numbered, whose time is running out. He's a man who's facing his impending death, and these are his urgent, pressing, weighty words to his friend, to his son in Christ, Timothy. All of Scripture is breathed out by God. Therefore, preach the word. Timothy, hold on to the truth and preach the word. Paul is so very clear. Because all of Scripture is breathed out by God, Timothy needs to preach it, to preach the words of Scripture. Words with a lowercase w. The words that point to the word of Scripture. Word with a capital W. Paul is urging Timothy to preach about Jesus, the Word incarnate, the Word made flesh. And even though this letter to Timothy is not written by John, it is no mistake that Paul uses this Greek word logos. We hear it used, we see it used, and we remember the substantial words of John 1 as they drip with meaning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory, glories of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Preach Jesus, Timothy. Preach Jesus. Jesus is who the world needs. But Jesus is not who the world wants. Here in chapter 3, Paul is not ashamed of his persecutions, mentioning them three times in verses 11 and 12. He warns that all who seek to live godly lives will be persecuted. And even in the face of this persecution, preach Jesus. The world needs Jesus, and your persecutors need Jesus too. Here Paul is exhibit A in both regards. Not only did he unashamedly preach Jesus when he was told to quit, when he was threatened with death and imprisonment, but once he had also been a persecutor. A persecutor who desperately needed Jesus and whose encounter with the living word left him changed forever and a champion of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul is saying to Timothy, even in the face of persecution and persecutors, preach the word. Paul is saying to you, even in the face of persecution and persecutors, preach the word. Paul doesn't try to embellish the popularity of this task to Timothy. He warns that a time is coming when people won't endure sound teaching. They'll have itching ears and they will find teachers willing to scratch them. But keep preaching, Timothy, because the world needs the word. The world needs Jesus. But let's be honest with each other. Sometimes preaching the word seems like a tall task, even a useless proposition. We drive by the man with a bullhorn on the street corner, preaching Jesus Christ, and we simply shake our heads. The world is so far gone, so calloused, so numb. 
Now, believe it or not, sometimes your pastor can even feel that way on a given Sunday morning as he stands here before you in the pulpit, laying his heart bare, preaching the word. These people, they're so callous, so numb. But we as God's people, all of us, whether we stand in the pulpit or whether we sit in the pew, we find comfort in the words of 1 Corinthians 1. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach, through the folly of preaching to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Here we as God's people find hope. We find hope and we find promise that God is working through His Word. His Word that we regularly gather to hear preached. That God is committed to His Word. And also in Hebrews, we're reminded that the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joint and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, the Word of God is active. And in His wisdom, God is using it to call a people to Himself. God in His wisdom has chosen to use the folly of man, His Word proclaimed, to call to Himself a redeemed people. As we gather together this evening, it's easy to think, that this is the pastor's job, or this is the missionary's job. And that's true, it is their job, but not exclusively. We read a text like Romans 10, and Romans 10 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how then will they call on whom in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? How are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? We, we read a text like that, or we hear a text like that, and we think, we're not sent. After all, we're still here in the pew in Inwood, Iowa. We're not sent. People like Sean Bootsma, they're sent. People like Brent Coy, they're obviously sent. They're not here anymore. They're not among us. But people of God, you have been sent. You will be sent. Today, maybe you were sent to your in-laws for dinner. Tomorrow, you might be sent to basketball practice or wrestling practice. You'll be sent back to the office, back to school. And in all of these places where we're sent in the coming week, there are people that need Jesus, that need to hear the word, the truth of Scripture. And God is sending you there to be ready ready to give an answer for the hope that you possess. Now that's the very broad application for you this evening, right? All of Scripture is God-breathed, therefore be ready to share it, be ready to preach it. But this evening I want to take the opportunity to make things a little bit more concrete. As all of you know, I'm, I'm no pastor. Most weeks I sit in the pew with my wife like anyone else. Now, that fact allows me this evening to be a little more candid with you than maybe your pastor would be, who has to see you week after week, service after service. So this evening, let's think about what this text means for our pastors, right? For Pastor Adam as a preacher of the Word, and just as importantly for us as a congregation, as people who gather together as hearers of the Word preached. Your pastor, as evidenced in his office and his ordination, has been called by God to preach. Just like Timothy, your pastor is called to preach the word, to be ready in season and out of season, to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. He's been called to be a bold herald of the good news concerning Jesus Christ. Interestingly enough, the first words Paul uses to expand on what preaching the word means 
are reprove and rebuke. Let's not miss the obvious conclusion that this means we, as God's people, should not always be comfortable with what we hear from the pulpit. There are times when it should leave us trembling, uncomfortable, and convicted of sin. Also, let's not miss the word that Paul chooses here to use in chapter 4, verse 10. Paul uses the word preach. He uses the word preach. Preach the word, Timothy. Now, Paul surely could have said, and we might be more comfortable with, teach. Teach the word. But he didn't. Now, to be sure, all preaching will contain elements of teaching, but there is a difference. Martin Luther, when describing the pulpit, where your pastor preaches from, says the pulpit is the throne for the word of God. The highest worship of God is the preaching of the word, because thereby are praised and celebrated the name and benefits of Christ. There is an authority in the word preached. That's why in the Reformed tradition, the pulpit is in the center of the church, elevated. Because the word is elevated above God's people, and we look to it for guidance. It's the center of our worship, the center of our life together. Here, the pulpit, the word preached. There's an authority in the word preached that goes far beyond merely a conveyance of knowledge or the ability of the one preaching. The preacher's primary task is not to teach, to mediate knowledge, but rather to get himself out of the way, to remove himself, laying bare, unveiling the glory of God as revealed in the Word of God. The brief time that we can spend parsing the subtle differences between preaching on the one hand and teaching on the other will likely not satisfy some of you. And that's all right. I think that Stephen Lawson described the difference very helpfully And that's where we're going to leave the topic this evening. He was asked, what is the difference between preaching and teaching? What is the difference between preaching and teaching? And he replied, if you don't know the difference, if you don't know the difference between preaching and teaching, then you've never heard preaching. You've never heard preaching. Now, undoubtedly, if what I've said about preaching, if what Paul has said about the Word of God is true, then there are large implications for us as Christ followers, as receivers of the preached Word. In the Reformed tradition of which we are a part, we talk broadly about two means of grace. There are two means of grace. They are first, the administration of the sacraments, and second, the preaching of the Word. Now, what we mean by means of grace is things outside of us. Things outside of us through which God shows us his favor. Through which he makes us more like Jesus. So it is that we hold that by the hearing of the... Excuse me. So it is that we hold that by the hearing of the preaching of the word, God, through the Holy Spirit, is making us more like Christ. Preaching is a transformative act. The Word of God going forward by the power of the Holy Spirit being used to change us, to shape us, to make us more like Christ. And that's important. It's the whole purpose of the Christian life, to be made more like Christ Jesus, to be a disciple of Christ. And that's what we're doing here this evening. That's what we're doing here right now. We're encountering the Word of God, which is living and active. We're encountering the Word of God through which in spite of all of my many shortcomings, God is conforming us more and more to the image of His Son. What a blessing. What a privilege. We should be hungry for this encounter. We should look forward to it all week long. But this is where we need to do a very honest self-evaluation. We should long to hear the word preached. We should delight to hear the word preached. We should throw ourselves as often as we can in front of this means of grace. We want to hear the word because we want to be like Jesus, the word incarnate. But do we? I mean, really, when push comes to shove, do we? Over the years, we've seen broader Christianity become too busy or maybe just plain apathetic 
toward the word preached. As a vast majority of churches cut down on weekly services, the number of encounters we have with the word preached shrinks. As we're more and more concerned with the entertainment value in our churches, the time spent expositing God's word dwindles. Now to be fair, the tradition from which we come, right, even our own denomination, is a mixed bag of sorts. Some churches have very much lost their zeal, their passion for encountering God's Word, the Word preached, while others maintain much more conviction and zeal. But even so, as a, as a church that still emphasizes the Word preached, we feel the slow tug of culture. Did you know that when the NFL was starting some 50 years ago, there were people who advised its founders that it was incredibly foolish. It was, it was beyond foolish to play their games on Sunday. After all, they reasoned, people won't watch football on Sunday. The church owns Sunday. How wrong they were. Because now, for the vast majority of our culture, and even some of us here, the NFL very clearly owns every Sunday in the fall. All we have to do is think about our own churches when it conflicts with a big game that we want to see. We'd rather encounter Joe Buck and Troy Aikman on television than encounter the Word of God preached. But even that is just a little too distant. Let's really take this close to home and make ourselves squirm a little. How many of us consider evening worship to be optional. To return to hear the word of God preached. To throw ourselves once more in this means of grace. After all, I've, I've got a family obligation to get together or my friend wants to have people over or, or the weather's beautiful outside and I'm, I'm simply going to enjoy creation. Or even more likely still, there's, there's a community service tonight. And we're really not that comfortable with the worship style at that other church or with what that other pastor will say. And, and no one's really going to notice if we're not there. But what about the call of the elders to gather to worship? What about the preaching of the Word? What about the throwing ourselves in the way once more of this means of grace so that we would be made more like Christ? Now, I don't want you to simply hear condescension upon anyone this evening who's ever missed a church service. There are legitimate reasons to miss. But I do want you to hear a challenge. If all of Scripture is God-breathed, if it is the wisdom of God to make us wise unto salvation, and God is using the preaching of His Word to make us more like Christ, how could our normal posture, how could our normal attitude not be one of eagerness? How can we not want to encounter Jesus more often? How can we ever be satiated? How could we settle for less? Now before we conclude, I know that some of you may be here this evening who think that this is all being blown out of proportion. Yeah, preaching is important, but this, this here, this is getting carried away. Listen to Paul's words. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also who have loved his appearing. To all who have loved his appearing. To all who have loved his appearing. How does Jesus Christ appear to people today? How does Christ appear to you today? His physical body is no longer on earth. So how? How does He appear? He appears when we encounter Him in the Word. The Word preached, just as Paul urged Timothy to do. Brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, there is so much at stake. There is a crown of righteousness at stake. And our eagerness for the Word, our posture towards the Word, our loving of Christ appearing in the word preached is a true indicator of the state of our hearts. 
It's a true indicator of the state of our souls. Let us pray this evening that God would make our hearts eager. Let us pray that God would make us hungry for the rich spiritual banquet that he sets before us in Scripture. Let us pray that we would long to encounter Jesus and that we would love his appearing. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening gathered together in your name, gathered together to hear you, to seek you, to find you. Father, may we be found in this place. May your spirit be here among us. And may the task of the preacher, the task of the pastor, may it, may it bear fruit. That your word would take root in our lives. And that it would bear fruit. Father, this evening as we reflect on the preaching of the word, we are especially thankful that you have given us a faithful minister. We thank you for Pastor Adam, for his faithfulness in the pulpit, his reverence for your word, and his desire to impress it upon our hearts and our minds that we, though baby steps we take, would continue walking towards you. Father, we ask that you would give him patience in his task, that you would give him hope, that you would reward his labors richly. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing our song of response, How Firm a Foundation.
Our offering for this evening will be for the Covenant Christian Education Fund. It will be received as you exit. Let's have a prayer for our offering. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the dedication to Christian education that this congregation has had over many years, and we pray that it will continue for many years to come. We pray for our covenant youth that as many of them as possible would be educated in the fear and knowledge of you, would be able to receive a distinctively Christian education. Father, we thank you for the way that you have helped us as a church fulfill our baptismal promises to these covenant children in partnering with their parents to make Christian education possible. Father, we pray richly that you would bless Inwood Christian School, that you'd bless Western Christian, Sioux Falls Christian. We pray that you would give their teachers faithful wisdom as they seek to not only convey facts and figures to our children, but to help them grow in discipleship in the fear and knowledge of the Lord as they seek to partner with the church and with Christian parents to raise up godly children who would walk with you all the days of their lives. Father, that's our prayer for our offering. That's our prayer for our covenant children in general, for each and every one that we are blessed to have among us here in our congregation. Father, we pray that you would bless this ministry and its endeavors. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we go forward into God's world, he blesses us with these words. He says to you, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift up his face upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord smile upon you and give you peace. And all God's people said, Amen.